Hello, Intro to Psychology students. Welcome to week three. We are almost at the halfway mark. Can you believe it? This week, we are back to three chapters for this week. We're covering chapters six, seven, and eight. So we're covering chapter six, which is all about learning, chapter seven, which is all about thinking and intelligence, and chapter eight, which is all about memory. Each chapter, you'll have four chapter questions. Please remember that your chapter questions should be about a paragraph in length. So each question, you should be able to provide about a paragraph's worth of information at the very least. Sometimes you might include more, but please no less than a paragraph for each question. Each week, once again, you'll have a video lecture you'll be able to watch, a link directly to the textbook, the PowerPoint slides for each of the chapters, and then your chapter questions. So we're gonna get right into it and we're gonna to get to chapter six. So chapter six is all about learning. This section is going to cover the three types of our responses to stimuli. And we're gonna be answering some really big questions in this chapter. Where does behavior, our behavior come from? How do we know what to do in response to our environment? We're gonna learn about the definition of learning. What is learning? And then also what we can do after we've learned something And at the most basic level, behaviors refer to any observable response. So how does learning contribute to what we're observing? Psychologists define learning as a relatively permanent change in behavior or the capacity for behavior due to experience. And we're going to cover that definition again. But what's important to note about is the processes that are at work as we come to know what we know. Loggerhead sea turtles, for example, their hatchlings are born knowing how to find the ocean and how to swim. And all they've done is emerged from the sand. Unlike the sea turtle, humans must learn how to swim. As humans, we pride ourselves on our ability to learn. But what's the difference when we, between us and animals? Well, what you just learned about in the difference between animals and humans is oftentimes referred to as unlearned behavior, also known as instincts or reflexes. Instincts and reflexes are innate behaviors that organisms are born with. It helps organisms adapt to their environment. If we separate those two things and we look strictly at reflexes, they are fast and involuntary responses to stimuli that are mediated by circuits in the spinal cord and brain stems that serve to promote your welfare. They are incredibly sim simple. It involves activity of specific body parts. It involves the prominent centers of the central nervous system, right? So think about your central nervous system, which is your spinal cord, and maybe the medulla in your brain stem. So one reflex is human babies are born with the sucking reflex. They innately know to suck on their, the mother's breasts when they're born in order to receive food. That's a reflex. Another reflex you might think of is when you go to the doctor's office. If the doctor hammers that little rubber hammer on your knee and your leg instinctively or reflexively, excuse me, kicks out. That's a reflex. Or imagine you're sitting in class when all of a sudden you hear a loud banging right outside the door. What would your very first reaction to the unexpected noise be? If you're like most people, you would immediately stop listening to the lecture and turn your head in the direction of the noise. This very normal response is called an orienting reflex. And psychologist Pavlov 
studied the orienting reflexes. These, are, these occur when we stop what we're doing to orient our sense organs in the direction of the unexpected stimuli. In short, we exhibit the orienting reflex to any type of novel stimulus or new stimulus. Other reflexes pull our bodies away from painful stimuli, as in when we step on a tack or a piece of glass, or touch a hot stove, or turn our heads in the direction of loud noises, and help us to stand upright and walk. Reflexes, however, have the disadvantages of being inflexible and not very adaptable to change, however. For example, we respond to stress or cold by forming goosebumps or bumps on the skin. That isn't something that you can stop from happening. This reflex appears to be left over from a time in which our species had more body hair. Goosebumps raise each strand of hair, which in times of stress makes an individual look larger, puffs them out a bit, which scares off predators or competitors, and in response to cold, traps more insulating air near the skin. As humans began to lose most of their body hair over time, the advantages of this reflex decreased, but we still retained the behavior. We still exhibit goosebumps. Now, instincts are a little bit different from reflexes. These are more innate patterns of behavior elicited by environmental stimuli that are, do not require any learning. So these are triggered by a broader range of events, things like aging, the change of seasons. They can be a little bit more complex. They can involve movement of the organism as a whole. Think sexual activity and migration and they can involve higher brain centers. So similar to reflexes, instincts do not need to be learned and are inflexible. However, instincts are much more complex than reflexes and are mediated by processes higher in the brain. One example of a human instinct is the contagious yawning or yawning in response to seeing others yawn. How often have you watched someone yawn and then thought instinctively, I'm yawning even though I'm not tired at all. That's an instinct. Although yawning has multiple functions, including cooling the brain, contagious yawning might be related to empathy, helping to synchronize the arousal state of whole groups. Question one for chapter six is identify three human instincts and why are they important to our survival? 20th century psychology was dominated by the beliefs that compared to other animals, human beings have relatively few reflexes and instincts, and that most human behavior results from learning. However, William James argued that human beings have more instincts than other animal, animals, although we are usually just unaware of them. According to James, our behavior simply appears more complex and thoughtful because we often face the need to choose between competing instincts. Animals with fewer instincts experience fewer conflicts, so their behavior appears to be more automatic and less thoughtful. James's approach to instinct and learning is echoed in the writings of contemporary psych evolutionary psychologists today who argue for an innate learning instinct that prepares human beings to learn certain things in particular ways based on our evolutionary history. For example, you might have learned to instinctively honk your horn when a potential car accident is going to occur. Cognitive psychologists also revive the flavor of James by suggesting that learned behavior resulting from experience can look very automatic and instinctive. For example, prejudice toward a group of people requiring le requires learning, but prejudiced behavior often occurs without much conscious awareness. People who consciously believe they are without prejudice toward members of minority groups will nonetheless sit farther away from an individual from that group than from members of the majority. So think about instincts. Identify three human instincts for question one in chapter six and why are they important to survival? For example, choosing to walk on a well-lit path 
at night in order to survive. That could be known as an instinct. Sexual activity and reproduction is an instinct. The instinct to reproduce, the instinct to crave social bonding with others is an instinct. Now, if we think about learning and learned behavior, learning also helps organisms to adapt to their environment, but learned behaviors involve change and experience. Reflexes and instincts are unlearned, whereas these are learned. Learning is defined as a relatively permanent change in behavior or knowledge that results from experience. It means acquiring skills and knowledge through experience. It involves conscious and unconscious processes. Associative learning specifically, is when an organism makes connections between stimuli or events that occur together in the environment. There are three approaches to learning that we're going to be studying in this chapter. One is classical conditioning, operant conditioning, and observational learning. So classical conditioning is the first type of associative learning. This was pioneered by Ivan Pavlov. His research on the digestive system of dogs unexpectedly led to his discovery of the learning process now known as classical conditioning. Classical conditioning is the process by which we learn to associate a stimuli and consequently two anticipated events. Pavlov noticed that dogs salivated not only at the taste of food, but also at the footsteps of the lab assistants walking towards their food. He realized that organisms have two types of responses to its environment, unconditioned, which is unlearned responses, and conditioned or learned responses. In his most famous, famous example, dogs were conditioned to associate the sound of a bell with food. When the dogs heard the bell, they anticipated food and began to salivate. This diagram shows you exactly how this occurred. So the dog salivates. This is the unconditioned response to the food. And the food is known as the unconditioned stimulus. So the food is the stimulus, and this is unconditioned. They are salivating instinctively or reflexively because of food. At the same time, when you ring a bell around a dog, they're not gonna salivate in response to that bell. This is a new stimulus to them. However, if you begin to present the ringing of the bell at the same time as the food, pairing them together, if you then remove the food, but merely ring the bell, the bell will then cause a salivating response even without the food being present. The bell has now become what we call a conditioned stimuli. There are also different types of conditioning. You have higher order conditioning. An established condition stimulus is paired with a new neutral stimulus, the second order stimulus, so that eventually the new stimulus also elicits the conditioned response without the initial condition stimulus being presented. So in this example, the cat is conditioned to salivate when they hear its electric can opener, because the can opener means that their can of food is being opened. However, there's a squeaky cabinet door that the food is probably stored in, and that is then paired with the can opener. So now the cat is gonna to begin to salivate when it hears the squeaky cabinet door. 
because the squeaky cabinet door also equals their food is about to be served to them. So it's kind of like a chain of command. So there's some general processes that are occurring in classical conditioning. First is acquisition. This is the initial period of learning when an organism learns to connect a neutral stimulus and an unconditioned stimulus. Usually this requires there to be a very short time interval between the neutral stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus and for the pairing to repeat it multiple times. In Pavlov's example, it wasn't as if he rang a bell five minutes after food was presented and he only did it once a day. That likely might not have helped. He paired the bell at the same time as the food over and over again for a long period of time. Now, sometimes conditioning can occur when the interval is up to several hours and the pairing occurs only once. Think about taste aversion. You likely ate something and it might have tasted bad. Say you had spoiled milk and you had it just the one time, but it was enough of a ch it happened, it was so terrible and averse to you that it needed to only happen one time in order for you then to be conditioned to say, never again, stay away. Now, extinction is when you decrease in the unconditioned response, when the unconditioned stimulus is no longer presented to the conditioned stimulus, with the conditioned stimulus. If the food stops being presented with the sound of the bell, then eventually the dog is going to stop responding to the bell. Spontaneous recovery is the return of the previously extinguished conditioned response following a rest period. So maybe they don't respond to the bell after a while. But then it sometimes spontaneously will come back. Now it's important to distinguish between stimuli. Organisms need to be able to distinguish between different stimuli in order to respond appropriately. Stimulus discrimination is when an organism learns to respond differently to various stimuli but that are similar. The dog can discriminate between the specific bell sound that signals for food and a similar bell sound that does not signal for food. Say you were using your cell phone to condition a dog and you used a specific ringtone to cause the dog to salivate. And then the next time you did it, you tried to use a totally different ringtone. The dog likely is going to know that. They're going to be able to discriminate between the different ringtones. Stimulus generalization, however, is when an organism demonstrates the conditioned response to stimuli that are similar to the conditioned stimulus. If an individual learns to dislike a specific spider, they will usually then dislike all spiders, or in some cases, just all bugs in general. Classical conditioning can also lead to what's called habituation. Habituation is learning not to respond to a stimulus that is presented repeatedly without change. As a stimulus is repeated, we learn not to focus our attention on it. It becomes less of a habit for us to respond to it. Now, after Pavlov's discovery with Pavlov's dog, this whole new form of psychology known as behaviorism was born with John B. Watson at the helm. He used the principles of classical conditioning that Pavlov discovered in the study of human emotion. Watson believed that all our behavior could be studied as a stimulus response reaction. He believed the principles of classical conditioning could be used to condition human emotions. And he conducted a famous study with Little Albert. Watson exposed Little Albert, who's a baby, to certain stimuli and conditioned the child to fear them. So he presented Little Albert with a neutral stimuli, a rabbit, a dog, cotton wool, a white rat, 
things like that. Watson then paired these with a loud sound every time little Albert touched the stimuli that caused him to feel fear. After repeatedly pairing these things, little Albert became fearful of the stimulus alone, such as the white rabbit. Although initially conditioned to fear specific stimuli, they were all furry and therefore through stimulus generalization, little Albert came to fear furry things including Watson in a Santa Claus mask. There is no evidence whether little Albert's fear was long lasting or not. Considering how long ago this study was done, this picture you see is an, actu an actual photograph. It's a drawing rendering of little Albert. That's how long ago this study was done. But you can see now that when you use the same techniques of Pavlov did with the dog and pairing a certain stimuli and conditioning it to an emotion, it actually affected little Albert's emotional reaction to things. You see some of this still today. Think about watching an infant respond to a loud stimulus. A fire truck goes down the road. A child may then learn to fear a fire truck or any other loud noises. This then led way for what was known as operant conditioning, which was a theory proposed by B.F. Skinner. In operant conditioning, an organism learns to associate a behavior and its consequences. So this is when we begin to talk about reinforcement or punishment. And this is all based on the law of effect. When looking for pleasant consequences or desired resu result, behavior is more likely to occur get again. When you're experiencing an unpleasant consequence or an undesired result, behavior is less likely to occur again. This makes sense. A good example is when we show up to work. This is the behavior. We then get paid. This is the pleasant consequence. The word consequence sometimes can confuse you because consequence always tends to be negative. Consequence is not negative. Consequence is just the result. So we continue to show up to work. Because we're getting a paycheck, it constantly makes us reinforce that good behavior. Skinner conducted experiments mainly with rats and pigeons to determine how learning occurs through operant conditioning. Things to note, positive in operant conditioning means to add something. So it doesn't just, it doesn't mean good, it means something is being added. We could be adding something bad. Negative means to remove something or take something away, not something bad. We could take something away that is good. Reinforcement means to increase a behavior, meaning we want, an, we want a particular behavior to increase, to continue going. Punishment is to decrease a behavior. When we want a behavior to stop or not happen as often. When we look at classical versus operant conditioning, classical conditioning was an unconditioned stimulus such as food being paired with a neutral stimulus, the bell, and the neutral stimulus eventually becomes the conditioned stimulus, which brings about the conditioned response. In operant conditioning, however, the target behavior is followed by reinforcement or punishment to either strengthen or weaken it, so that the learner is more likely to exhibit the di desired behavior in the future. Now, the timing of the stimulus occurs immediately before the response in classical conditioning. But the stimulus in operant conditioning, whether it's reinforcement or punishment, occurs soon after the response. Skinner studied operant conditioning using the Skinner box, placing animals inside an operant conditioning chamber containing a lever that when pressed causes food to be dispensed as a reward. We're going to be breaking down reinforcement and punishment. So in reinforcement, which is when we want behavior, desired behavior to increase, 
we have two different types of reinforcement. We have positive reinforcement. So this is when something is added to increase the likelihood of behavior. Everyday examples of this are high grades, paychecks, and praise. We add high grades in order to increase good academic behaviors. We add money to your bank accounts in order to increase your behavior of showing up to work. Negative reinforcement, however, is when something is removed in order to increase the likelihood of behavior. An everyday example of this is the beeping sound that will only go away when you put your seatbelt on. We are negatively reinforcing you putting your seatbelts on when you get in your car. We remove the annoying beeping sound. Once you've done something we wanted you to do, we increased your likelihood of buckling your seatbelt. Now in terms of punishment, We have both positive and negative punishment as well. Positive punishment is something with, is when something is added in order to decrease the likelihood of behavior. So when we add scolding to a student for texting in class, we hope that our additional scolding will then decrease their texting behavior. When negative punishment is used, that means that something is removed in order to decrease the likelihood of behavior. Taking away a favorite toy when a child misbehaves, putting them into timeout. Now, shaping in operant conditioning is a tool that's used instead of rewarding only the target behavior we reward successive approximations of a target behavior. So we break down behaviors into many small achievable steps. Useful when teaching a complex chain of events. It's used commonly by animal trainers, right? When you might give a dog a treat for listening, responding to their name when you call them. And then as you escalate up to sitting and rolling over and jumping, then you are shaping the target behavior. In this case, there are four steps. You want to reinforce any response that resembles the desired behavior. Then you want to reinforce the response that more closely resembles the desired behavior no longer reinforcing previously reinforced responses, meaning you can't go back and reinforce the little things. You then begin to reinforce the response that even more closely resembles the desired behavior. And you continue to do this only until only the desired behavior is what's reinforced, not any of those previous beginning steps. Now there are primary and secondary reinforcers. Rewards to reinforce behavior can come in many forms. Praise, stickers, many of you in elementary school might have used a sticker system where you've got a sticker in order to reward you. Money, think about allowances that you might have had or you might still be getting for good behavior. And then toys, many of you probably have cell phones. You might have gotten those as reinforcement for good behavior. Now, primary reinforces. These are things that have innate reinforcing qualities. Food, water, sleep, sex, and pleasure. The value of these reinforcers does not need to be learned. Food is important. You need it to survive. Same with water, sleep, sex, and pleasure. Joy. Okay. Secondary reinforcers are those that have no inherent value. Their value is learned and becomes reinforcing when linked with a primary reinforcer. Praise as a secondary reinforcer is linked with affection, a primary reinforcer. Money is only reinforcing when it can be used to buy other things, such as things that satisfy basic needs, food, or other secondary reinforcers. Many people assume money is a primary reinforcer when it's really not 
Money only reinforces because it buys either a primary reinforcer like food or water or other secondary reinforcers. Tokens are also a secondary reinforcer that can be exchanged for other things. And token economies are used in many settings to encourage correct behavior, such as prisons, schools, and mental institutions. For example, when I was in junior high, we used what was called a merit system in order to encourage correct behavior. If you behaved correctly, you got merits. They were like these little slips that were like little awards, kind of like fake monopoly money. The end of the end of the school year, you could go to the merit shop and buy a bunch of things. Now, reinforcement schedules. The best way to teach a behavior is with positive reinforcement. However, there are many ways that positive reinforcement can be administered. Continuous reinforcement is when an organism receives a reinforcer each time it displays a behavior. This is the very quickest way to teach a behavior. A dog receives a treat every time it sits when told to. And timing is critical. The treat must be presented immediately after sitting in order for the dog to associate the target behavior with the consequences. However, the trainer suddenly stops providing treats, the dog will stop sitting, so another type of reinforcement is then used once the behavior is learned. Partial reinforcement is when the organism does not get reinforced every time they display the desired behavior. They're reinforced intermittently. And there are even several types of partial reinforcement. You've got fixed versus variable. So fixed is the number of responses between reinforcements or the amount of time between reinforcement is sent and unchanging. So every fifth time a dog sits when being told, he gets a treat. Or after every two minute sprint, a dog gets a treat. Variable, however, is when the number of responses between reinforcements or the amount of time between reinforcement varies or changes. First, it's every two tricks, then it's every seven tricks, then it goes back to three, then it goes up to 10. Now, interval versus ratio reinforcement scales. An interval scale is the schedule is based on the time between reinforcements, meaning that it's not about the amount of times they produce the behavior, but the time between the reinforcements. And ratio is the schedule is based on the number of responses between reinforcements. If we combine these two, we have four different reinforcement scales. We have a fixed interval scale, where reinforcement is delivered at predictable time intervals, and so this is patients take pain relief medication at set times. Variable interval is reinforcement is delivered at unpredictable time intervals, checking your Facebook or Instagram or TikTok and potentially your cases. You do this at variable intervals. Happens at unpredictable times. But it's like a little re reward. Fixed ratio is reinforcement is delivered after predictable number of responses. So factory workers being paid for every X number of items manufactured for example. Variable ratio scale is reinforcement is delivered after an unpredictable number of responses, similar to gambling. Think of like slot machines. You have no idea. It's unpredictable when you might exactly be reinforced. Oftentimes, gambling is discussed a lot in learning psychology. Some research suggests that pathological gamblers use gambling to compensate for abnormally low levels of the hormone norepinephrine, which is associated with stress, and it secretes in moments of arousal and thrill. Our brain is reacting to the thrill of winning money at unpredictable times. Research conducted by Edward C. Tolman found that learning could still occur without reinforcement. This introduced the idea that there is a cognitive aspect to learning. While studying rats, he found that he put them in a maze to learn their way through it. They could eventually form a cognitive map, a mental picture 
of the layout of the environment. After 10 sessions in the maze, without food as reinforcement, food was placed at the exit, and the rats were able to very quickly exit the maze, showing that they had learned their way out. This is what we call latent learning. Learning that occurs but is not observable in behavior until there is a reason to demonstrate it. For example, children may learn behaviors from their parents that they do not demonstrate until they are older. A child may learn the route to school from watching his parents drive there, but will not demonstrate this until they can drive themselves or have to get there by bike, walking, etc. This happened for most of you. Many of you might be old enough to, have dri to drive to school. You didn't need to be told how to get there. You just knew from when you watched your parents do it as you got older. Now, observational learning. Observational learning is learning by watching others and then imitating it. It's like creating a model. The individual, the model is the individual performing the imitated behavior. So we find a model, we observe that model, and then we learn by watching them and then imitating them. This example here, the spider monkey learned to drink water from a plastic water bottle by seeing the behavior modeled by a human. Other forms of observational learning, a fitness class like yoga. You can see this instructor is demonstrating the correct stance and movement for the students in the class. And models don't have to be present for learning to occur. Through symbolic modeling, this child can learn a behavior by watching someone demonstrate it on television. This then, allowed behaviorists to start thinking about what was known as social learning theory. In order to explain how learning occurred without external reinforcement, Alba Brandura proposed the social learning theory. He believed that observational learning involved more than just imitation and that internal mental states must be involved. So he created four steps in the modeling pro process. There must be attention, meaning focusing on the model and the behavior that you wish to intimidate, imitate. Then retention, remembering what you observed, putting it into your memory, retaining it. And then reproduction, the ability to perform the behavior and reproduce that behavior. And then you must have motivation. You must want to copy the behavior. Now, motivation depends on what happened to the model. If the model experienced good stuff after that behavior was elicited, then obviously motivation is going to be present. But if they experience bad stuff, then they may not be so likely to model that behavior. Now, vicarious reinforcement is the process where the observer sees the model rewarded, making the observer more likely to imitate the model's behavior. And vicarious punishment is process where the observer sees the model punished, making the observer less likely to imitate the model's behavior. That's why there were so many after-school specials, television shows that talked about drug use and safe sex and stuff like that. They wanted to use this social learning theory in order to model vicarious punishment and reinforcement and things of the like. Now, Bandura also conducted a famous learning study known as the Bobo doll experiment. This was used to study the modeling of, of aggressive and violent behaviors. Children observed adults act aggressively toward a five foot Bobo doll. These were these blow up dolls that if you hit them, they sort of just bounce right back. They don't exist anymore. But children observed adults acting aggressively toward a five-foot bobo doll, meaning they watched someone older than them, so this was natural observation. The adult was then either punished or praised or ignored for their behavior. The children were then given the opportunity to play with the bobo doll themselves. If the child had seen the adult punished, 
they were less likely to act aggressively towards the doll. If the child had seen the adult praised or ignored, they were more likely to imitate the adult behavior. Bandura concluded that children watch and learn from the adults around them, which can have both pro-social and anti-social consequences. Which leads us to the question, can video games make us violent? Psychological researchers study this topic and suggest that there's a correlation between watching violence and aggression in children. Now your questions for this week we went over question one around instincts. Now question two is sort of a philosophical question. How would it feel if you could no longer learn anything new? Suppose starting now you were unable to learn anything new. What does this mean to you and how would this impact your life? How would your life look? What could you do successfully in the world if all you could do was remember and learn what you've already learned and nothing new past this point? Question th three is about children viewing and imitating violent actions seen on TV or in movies. I'm asking you, how can parents, teachers, and our care providers help overcome the influence of violence in the media? And question four is consider how women are portrayed on television and movies, in video games, or in other media. What does this tell developing girls and young women about who and what they should be? Are any of the messages realistic? I want you to think about social learning theory. Those four big components, attention, retention, reproduction, motivation. I'm certainly not saying we need to punish women who are beautiful. But I'm wondering if we reinforce different types of female representations rather than one specific type in order to help us develop a better view, a more realistic view of women. Now, chapter seven. Chapter seven is all about thinking and intelligence. Some big questions we're gonna ask this time is what is thinking? How do we use it? If I said for you, describe what thinking is or define what thinking is, it could be a difficult definition, even though you're doing it right now. It's something you're doing all day, every day, but defining it is so tricky. Same with intelligence. What is it and how do you use it? This gives way for cognitive psychology. Cognitive psychology or cognition, most simply, is thinking. It encompasses the processes that are associated with perception, knowledge, problem solving, judgment, language, and memory. Now memory is going to get its own chapter, which we'll cover in chapter eight. The word cognition, as, it, as in the term cognitive psychology, is derived from Latin. Cogito, which literally means to think. Thinking allows us to manipulate information internally cons to construct models of the world, plan our interactions with that world, and regulate ourselves to meet our goals. Now cognition, if you look at this diagram, is information sensations are entering our brain. Our emotions and our memories and our thoughts are then being processed externally inside of our brains. And it's going through a cycle, right? Emotional memories, emotions and memories create and lead to thoughts, which may circle back to more emotions and memories and thoughts. But then those thoughts eventually become our behaviors. So our sensations and information are received by our brains, filtered through emotions and memories, and then process to become thoughts, 
which then lead to our behaviors. Now, it's important to talk about how our brain organizes all of this. How is it that we keep those emotions and memories and thoughts clear in our brains? We first start with concepts. These are categories of linguistic information, images, ideas, or memories. These are used to see relationships among different elements of experience. They can be complex and abstract, so think about the idea of justice and morality. Or they can be concrete, types of birds, types of fruits. Now, a prototype is the best example or representation of a concept. So, for example, Mahatma Gandhi could be a prototype for a category of civil disobedience. Or a pro athlete could be a prototype for athleticism. Our brains create prototypes. We then have naturalistic and artificial concepts. Natural concepts are created naturally through either direct or indirect experience. For example, our concept of snow, that's natural. It happened around us. We understood it from there. Artificial concepts, however, are defined by specific set of characteristics. These are properties of geometric shapes. Think squares, triangles. Okay. There are also different kinds of concepts beyond the natural and the artificial. You've got faulty concepts, relational concepts, disjunctive concepts. But the two I want you to focus on are the natural concepts and the artificial concepts. From here, our brains create schemata or a schema, which is a mental construct consisting of a collection of related concepts. When a schema is activated, we automatically make assumptions about the person, object, or situation. For example, a role schema makes assumptions about how an individual in certain roles will behave. If I were to ask you what assumptions come to mind about a librarian, they might be old, maybe like a little bit like mean and um, tell us to shush a lot. And because of the role schema and the assumptions we have about individuals in certain roles and how they behave. Now, an event schema could also be known as a cognitive script. This is a set of routine or automatic behaviors. They can vary widely among different cultures and countries, but it does dictate our behavior and it makes habits very difficult to break. For example, when riding in an elevator, we automatically stand facing the door. Could you imagine if you got into an elevator and all faced with your back to the door of an elevator? Couldn't do it. Couldn't do it at all. Another uh, cognitive script or event schema could be when a waiter takes your order. You expect to receive the proper food. Or the whole act of going to a restaurant. You walk in. There's probably a host or a hostess. How many in your party? Some of you might actually count how many are in your party before you walk in. When you're seated, you'll probably expect to be handed a menu. After a reasonable period of time, your waiter will appear to take your order, and so on until the bill arrives and you pay for your meal. The experience of eating at a restaurant tends to have a script to it, a set of routine or automatic behaviors. Other event schemas are things like concerts. They can be difficult to change because they are automatic. When we receive a text, our event schema is to pick up our phone and reply. The problem is that this automatic reaction will arise even in situations when it's not safe to do so. Think texting and driving. Our event schema and our cognitive maps in our brains take over and say, 
It's time to respond to that text I just got on my phone. Even though, technically, you can't. Texting while driving is dangerous, but it is difficult. Event schemas for some people to resist. Research suggests that just the event schema of regularly checking our phone makes it increasingly difficult to resist picking it up while driving. We all can probably agree. It could be interesting to talk about event schemas across cultures. Do you think they would be the same? Think about holidays. Would an event schema for Christmas be the same for every family? Many people don't celebrate Christmas. Or even Thanksgiving. You might also have a concert. If I said a music concert schema, someone your age might think of a big, huge, giant concert, country, for example, or pop music, Coachella. But if I were to ask my grandparents about a music concert, they might be thinking more classical orchestral music. Event schemas can be different culturally, even generationally. Now language is very much so wrapped up in cognition, thinking and intelligence. Language is a communication system that involves using words and systematic rules to organize those words to transmit information from one individual to another. Now, it's important to talk about the components of language. We have the lexicon. This is the words of a given language. So some of you might be bilingual and actually know different words and have multiple lexicons. Now, grammar is the set of rules that are used to convey meaning through the use of the lexicon. Grammar is what gives us verbs and adverbs and nouns. A phoneme is a basic sound unit, a, uh, e, o, a, uh, stuff like that. Morphemes are the smallest units of language that convey some type of meaning. Now, language is constructed through semantics and syntax. Semantics is the meaning we derive from morphemes and words. The syntax, however, is the way we way words are organized into sentences. Now, language and development, language development was first proposed by Noam Chomsky. He proposed that the mechanisms underlying language acquisition are biologically determined. Language develops in the absence of formal instruction. Language acquisition follows similar patterns in children from different cultures and backgrounds. He also formed the case of a critical period. Proficiency at acquiring language is maximal early in life. Being deprived of language during the critical period impedes the ability to fully acquire and use language. The case of genie, for example, the effects of language deprivation during the critical period can be seen in the case study of genie. She was found at the age of 13 after being raised in neglectful and abusive conditions. She grew up with virtually no social interaction and was a unable to speak when found. With help, Jeannie was able to acquire vocabulary, but was not able to learn the grammatical aspects of language. This was all done in 1965 by Noam Chomsky, by the way. He started the revolution of how we study language. He argued that if linguists looked only at the sentences people produce, they would never uncover all the principles underlying language. Without looking deeper into language, he said, they could not explain, for example, why the sentence, this is my old friend, can have more than one meaning. Nor could they account for the similar meaning conveyed by such seemingly different sentences as, don't give up just because things look bad, and it ain't over till it's over. To take these aspects of language into account, Chomsky chose a more abstract level of analysis. He suggested that behind the string of words people produce, which he called surface structures, 
that is there is deep structure in an abstract representation of the relationships expressed in a sentence. For example, the surface structure, the shooting of the psychologist was terrible, can represent either of two deep structures. One, that the psychologist had terrible aim, or two, that it was terrible that someone shot the psychologist. Chomsky's analysis of deep and surface structures was important because it encouraged psychologists to analyze not just verbal behavior and grammatical rules, but also mental representations. Now, the stages of language and communication can be looked at from zero to three months, there's reflexive communication. So everything is a reflex. Babies are cooing and just making noises as a reflex. From three to eight months, again, reflexive communication, but interest in others. So babies and infants may respond to funny noises. This is why parents might like make like noises in babies' faces. Then from eight to 13 months, you have intentional communications and sociability. You then also have 12 to 18 months. First words are occurring. 18 to 24 months, simple sentences of two words. Then two to three years, you've got sentences of three or more words. And then three to five years, complex sentences and can now have conversations. In cognition, we also study problem solving. And it's important to talk about problem solving strategies. First, you've got trial and error, continuing trying different solutions until the problem is solved. You also then have algorithm, step-by-step -step problem solving formulas. You've got the heuristic problem solving, which is general problem solving framework, shortcuts, a rule of thumb, working backwards. So this is where you begin solving the problem by focusing on the end result and or breaking large tasks into a series of smaller steps. Now, there are different types of times when people use heuristics. When one is faced with too much information, they might start using shortcuts or working backwards or breaking large things down into smaller steps. When the time to make a decision is limited, so if someone comes to you and says, I need to have this in 24 hours and you only have a day, you might go to shortcuts or a rule of thumb. When the decision to be made is unimportant, when it's not make or break, when there is an ac where is access to very little information to use in making the decision, or when an appropriate heuristic happens to come to mind in the same moment. So, an example of trial and error is Restarting a, restarting a phone. Turning off Wi-Fi, turning off Bluetooth in order to determine why your phone is malfunctioning. Right? So your phone starts to malfunction, you use trial and error. Well, first I'm going to do this, well then I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to do this in order to see if that helps turn my phone. The algorithm is then using an instructional manual for installing new software on your computer. Or getting a piece of furniture from Ikea and using the instructional manual in order to put it together appropriately. Heuristic is working backwards, breaking a task into steps. This is a general problem solving framework, so to speak. Cognitive psychologists use some of the problem solving that we learned in the last slide to help people improve and practice their cognitive abilities. So you might do Sudoku. Many people practice every day with puzzles such as Sudoku. Or many people today are playing things like Wordle in order to help their cognitive and learning skills. You also have spatial reasoning. Connecting all nine dots with four connecting straight lines without lifting your pencil from the paper. Here are the answers, should you need them. Now some pitfalls to problem solving. 
Mental sets. Persistence in approaching a problem in a way that has worked in the past. A set way of looking at a problem. That's a mental set. This becomes a problem when that way is no longer working. For example, functional fixedness, the inability to perceive an object being used for something other than what it was designed for. Imagine you have a candle, thumbtacks, and a box of matches. You need to mount the candle on the wall and light it. What do you do? Very few people think to use the box as a holder for the candle, which can be tacked to the wall because they are fixated on its normal function. Biases also can come about in problem solving. Knowledge and reason are used to make decisions. However, sometimes our ability to reason can be swayed by our biases. The anchoring bias is a tendency to focus on one piece of information when making a decision or solving a problem. That one piece of information will not allow us to see the rest of the knowledge and information we need in order to make a better decision. Confirmation bias is a tendency to focus on information that confirms your existing beliefs. I'm going to focus on this because I know this to be true regardless and that's going to potentially sway you to only exist and focus on information that confirms what you believe. Now hindsight bias leads you to believe that the event you just experienced was predictable even though it was not. Representative bias is the tendency to unintentionally stereotype someone or something. And the availability heuristic is the tendency to make a decision based on an example, information, or recent experience that is readily available to you even though it may not be the best example to inform your decision. So we just covered cognition, thinking. Now on the other side of things, We've got intelligence. What is intelligence? Psychologists have come up with many different ways to define intelligence. Charles Spearman, for example, believed intelligence consisted of one general factor called G. He focused on the commonalities amongst various intellectual abilities. Raymond Cattell, however, divided intelligence into two components. You have crystallized intelligence, meaning acquired knowledge and the ability to retrieve it, so knowing facts and fluid intelligence, the ability to see complex relationships and solve problems, meaning knowing how to do something. From here, Sternberg replaced that with what was called the triarchic theory of intelligence. This theory identifies three types of intelligence, practical, creative, and analytical. Analytical intelligence is our academic intelligence problem solving and computation. You then have practical intelligence, street smarts and common sense. You then have creative intelligence, imaginative and innovative problem solving. And those three all interact with one another. You don't have one or the other, you have a combination of the three. From there, Howard Gardner then proposed that each person possesses at least eight intelligences, including linguistic intelligence, logical and mathematical intelligence, musical intelligence, bodily kinesthetic intelligence, spatial intelligence, interpersonal intelligence, intrapersonal intelligence, and naturalist intelligence. Now, inter- and intrapersonal intelligences are often combined and called emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is the ability to understand the emotions of yourself and others, show empathy, understand social responsibilities and cues, and regulate your own emotions and respond in culturally appropriate ways. So now we have a theory of intelligence that has multiple types of intelligence, which honestly is so much more appropriate. But the emotional intelligence aspect wasn't adapted until almost 1980. Now for most of you, you're thinking, oh my gosh, that's so, so long ago. 
but it's really not in the grand scheme of things. Daniel Goleman was the one who created the emotional intelligence. He pioneered that term. He argued that a concept of intelligence that is based solely on cognitive abilities is too limiting. Even people with relatively high cues can fail to succeed in life and sometimes do things that appear to be downright unintelligent. In Goleman's view, emotional intelligence includes awareness of our own emotional states, accurate assessments of your own abilities, self-confidence, self-control, trustworthiness, conscientiousness, the ability to adapt to changes, innovation or creativity, achievement motivation, commitment to completing goals, initiative of self-motivation, and a sense of optimism. In other words, an emotionally intelligent person is a confident self-starter who is ethical and adaptable, the kind of person who sets a goal and works towards it without letting minor obstacles derail their progress. This then led cognitive psychologists to think about creativity. Creativity is the ability to generate, create, or discover new ideas, solutions, and possibilities. Creative people usually have intense knowledge about something. They can work on it for years. They can look at novel solutions, seek out advice and help of other experts, and take risks. Creativity is often thought of as one's ability to engage in divergent thinking. This is outside of the box thinking. It's used when more than one possibility exists on a situation. Now, convergent thinking is the ability to provide a correct and well-established answer or solution to a problem. This leaves you to think about this particular question. If you could make a trade, would you want to have a genius level IQ or be an artistic or musical genius? Would you be willing to trade a year of your life, five years of your life, your motor skills, your future income, to have one or the other. Now, cognitive psychologists also were those that created measures of intelligence. And measuring intelligence can come in many, many forms. A person's intelligence quotient, or IQ, is a score earned on a test designed to measure intelligence. Now, the question is, is how do psychologists ensure that tests function as a valid measure of intelligence? First, you have the Stanford Binet Intelligence Scale. This was done early in the 1900s by Alfred Binet. He developed an intelligence test to use on children to determine which ones might have difficulty in school. Then Lewis Terman, a Stanford psychologist, modified Binet's work by standardizing the administration of the test and testing thousands of children to establish a norm. This is where you got standardization. The manner of administering, scoring, and interpreting of results is consistent. And then norming them, giving a test to a large population so data can be collected comparing groups such as age groups. That resulting data provide norms or referential scores used to interpret future scores. You can see Binet here. He was a French psychologist. From there, we then had the WAS, or the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale. David Wexler's definition of intelligence was the global capacity of a person to act purposefully, to think rationally, and to deal effectively with his environment. In 1939, Wexler developed a new IQ test by combining several subtests from other intelligence tests tapped into a variety of verbal and nonverbal skills. One of the most extensively used intelligence tests. The Wexler Intelligence Scale for Children is one of the many variations used today that tests one, verbal comprehension, visual spatial skills, fluid reasoning, working memory, and processing speed. Now, the Flynn effect, after years of use within schools and communities, periodic recalibrations of WAS led to an observation known as the Flynn effect, the observation that each generation has a significantly higher IQ than the last. The rest of this chapter is just sort of talking about the source 
Um, these two slides are just talking about the standard deviation of IQ. I'm going to skip over that. I don't want to cover that too much because I do want to make sure that we talk about the source of intelligence. Nature or nurture. The nature perspective states that intelligence is inherited from a person's parents. The heritability of intelligence is often researched using twin studies. So identical twins are raised together and identical twins raised apart exhibit a higher correlation between IQ scores than siblings of fraternal twins that were raised together. So meaning that identical twins that were raised apart had similar IQs than those children who were raised together. Now the nurture perspective means that intelligence is shaped by a child's developmental environment. If parents present children with intellectual stimuli, it will be reflected in the child's intelligence level. Many psychologists now believe levels of intelligence are a combination of both, your genetics and your environment. Now the range of reaction is that the theory that each person responds to the environment in a unique way based on his or her genetic makeup. Genetic makeup is a fixed quantity. Whether you reach your full intellectual potential is dependent upon your environmental factors. And then lastly, we want to discuss learning disabilities. Learning disabilities are cognitive disorders that affect different areas of cognition, particularly language or reading. Specific neurological impairments, not an intellectual or developmental problem, often affect children with average to above average intelligence, exhibit comorbidity with other disorders, meaning when you have one learning disability, you may also oftentimes find a second disability. A learning disability resulting in a struggle to write is known as dysgraphia, having difficulty putting their thoughts down on paper. Oppositely, you have dyslexia. This is the inability to correctly process letters, most common learning disability in children. They may mix up the letters within words and sentences. They may reverse them. Now your questions for chapter seven starts with emotional intelligence. So go back to Daniel Goleman. What influence do you think emotional intelligence plays in your personal life? Emotional intelligence is your ability to be self-aware, self-confident, but also to empathize with others. So really discuss how someone having high emotional intelligence can really play a role in your emotion, in your personal life. Now the case of Candace. Case of Candace is in your textbook. Make sure to find the case of Candace. Do you think that Candace benefited or suffered as a result of consistently being passed on to the next grade? If you're struggling to find the case of Candace, it means that you're not reading the textbook clearly. Make sure you read chapter seven in the text. Question three is practical intelligence. Describe a situation in which you would need to use practical intelligence. And four, cultural intelligence. Describe a situation in which cultural intelligence would help you communicate better. Your text outlines both of these types of intelligence. Okay, cultural intelligence could be things like going to a different city and needing to be able to navigate that city, but not speaking the language, okay? or being in a new state where they might culturally react differently to different things. Excellent. Now, moving on to chapter eight. This is our chapter on memory. The study of memory looks at some of these questions. How do we process and store information in our brains? Are there different types of memory? How do we then retrieve memories? But then on the flip side, why do we forget? What leads us to forget? Now human memory can be represented as an information processing system. 
consisting of three basic processes, encoding, storage, and retrieval of information. Memory involves a set of processes used to encode, which involves the type of input of information into the memory system, store, which is the retention of the encoded information, and then retrieve it, meaning getting the information out of memory and back into our awareness. Now, memory does not exist in isolation. Cognitive psychologists see memory as a part of a continuum of information processing that begins with attention, sensation, perception, and learning, and then progresses to the use of stored information in thinking, problem solving, language, and intelligent behavior. Now, the information processing viewpoint of cognition arose from developments in computer. Psychologists sought to apply a computer metaphor to the working of the mind. Information flows in both directions along the continuum, leading to both bottom-up and top-down processing. So encoding is converting information into a form that's usable in our memory. Storage is retaining that information, and retrieval is then bringing that stored information to mind. Now, if we break those three parts down, we look closer at what encoding is. When the brain receives information from the environment, it labels and codes it. So think about when you're typing up your chapter questions, you're saving it and you're putting a label on it. And then you may be putting it into a file with all of your other psychology work. And it connects new concepts to existing concepts. So it puts it in a way that allows you to understand it in relation to other things that you might already have saved in that file. And there are two types of ways that this is processed. You have an automatic processing system, the encoding of details like time, space, frequency, and the meaning of words. This is usually done without your conscious awareness. So example, remembering when you last studied. Then there's effortful processing. This encoding of details takes time and effort. What you last studied, learning new skills, okay? So when you first learn new skills, such as driving a car, you have to put forth effort and attention to encode that information about driving. Once you know how to drive, you can encode additional information about the skill really automatically. For those of us who had vehicles that had crank windows, but then when we got newer vehicles that had automatic windows, we didn't have to do a lot to encode the new information for this new window because we'd already learned the skill of driving. In today's digital environment, it is common for psychologists to illustrate these processes by comparing the way the brain and computers process information. Both the brain and the computer encode of information must occur before the information can be processed further. One important aspect of code encoding is paying attention to the incoming information. For instance, I might get a notice that the school's computer network will be taken offline while updates are made. If I'm not paying attention, I won't encode that information and won't be able to remember it later. Then when I'm posting something for class, I'll get logged out and not be able to finish. We then move on to types of encoding. You have semantic encoding, encoding of words and their meanings. This is the most effective form of encoding. Attaching meaning to information makes it easier to recall later. How many of you have used flashcards in order to attach the definition of something to something? This involves a deeper level of processing. You also have visual encoding. So this is the encoding of images. Words that create a mental image, such as a car, a dog, a book, 
these are concrete words, are easier to recall than words such as level, truth, and value. These are abstract words. There isn't a clear picture to these three words. You then have acoustic coding. So this is the encoding of, uh, encoding of sounds. So the encoding of what a trumpet sounds like or a saxophone sounds like. You don't have to do much in order for a memory of that sound to come to your brain. You then have the self-reference effect, the tendency for an individual to have better memory for information that relates to oneself in comparison to material that has less personal relevance. Now, this makes a ton of sense. Obviously, something that's relevant to you is going to be something that's going to be much easier to encode and you're going to have a much better memory for if you have a personal attachment to it. Now storage. So we've covered encoding, now we move on to storage. Baddeley and Hitch proposed a model of storage where short-term memory has different forms depending on the type of information received. They believe that storing memories is like opening different files on a computer and adding information. So you have three short-term systems. You have the visual spatial sketch pad, the episodic buffer, and the phonological loop. According to their model, a central executive supervises the flow of information between these three systems. And if they move past those three systems, they then go into our long-term memory. Now the AS model was the storage and the creation is the creation of a permanent record of information. Right? So when you're storing something on your computer, you're creating a permanent record of the information. Now, the Atkinson-Schifrin model of memory is where information passes through three distinct stages in order for it to be stored in long-term memory. This was based on the belief that memories are processed the same way that a computer processes information. So it receives the sensory input. It goes into the brain. Information not transferred to the short-term memory is then lost. And then any information that is rehearsed over and over again then moves to the long-term memory. And anything that doesn't move on to the long-term memory is then lost. From here we have sensory memory. This is the storage of brief sensory events such as sights, sounds, and tastes. Sensory memory is only stored for up to a couple of seconds. This is the first step in processing stimuli from the environment. So sensory memory, think back to the sensation and perception chapter. Our sensory memory is your brain is taking in all of your five senses everything that it sees, that it's looking at right now, everything that it hears, touches, tastes, and smells. If the information is not important to us, it's discarded. If the information is valuable, then it moves into our short-term memory. You can see this in the Stroop effect. This was discovered when, while studying sensory memory and describes why it is difficult for us to name a color when the word and the color of the word are different. From our sensory memory, you then get our short-term memory or our working memory. This is a temporary storage system that processes incoming sensory memory and it lasts about 20 seconds. And the capacity is usually about seven items, which are plus or minus two, meaning five to nine. Short-term memories are either discarded or stored in the long-term memory. Now, memory consolidation is when you take something from the short-term memory and transfer it to the long-term memory. One way memory consolidation can be achieved is through rehearsal. Our brains rehearse consciously repeating information to be remembered. From the long-term memory, this is our continuous storage of information. It has no limit and is like the information you store on the hard drive of a computer. 
there are two components of long-term memory, explicit and implicit. Explicit memory is declarative memory, memories of facts and events we can consciously remember and recall or declare. Explicit memories include two types. You have semantic. This is your knowledge about words, concepts, and language. For example, knowing who the president is is semantic memories. Episodic is information about events we have personally experienced. Remembering your fifth birthday party. The what, where, when of an event. This is also called and known as the autobiographical memory. A small number of people, including actress Mary Lou Henner, have a highly superior autobiographical memory known as hyperthymesia. You then, on the other side of long-term memory, have implicit memories. Implicit memories are memories that are not part of our consciousness. They're formed through our behaviors. So for example, you have procedural. This stores information about how to do things, your skills and actions, how to ride a bike, tie your shoelaces. Implicit memory also includes behaviors learned through emotional conditioning. You might have a fear of spiders, but not consciously remember why or what occurred in order to condition that fear. So we've gone through encoding, we've gone through storage, and now we're at retrieval. Now, how do we get our long-term memories back out of storage? We need to retrieve them. This is the act of getting information out of our memory storage and back into our conscious awareness. Retrieval is needed for everyday functioning, knowing how to drive to work or how to perform your job once you get there. Now there are three ways to retrieve information. One is recall, being able to access information without cues. This is used for an essay test, for example. Two, recognition, being able to identify information that you have previously learned after encountering it again. Think of use for a multiple choice test. Then number three is relearning, learning information that you previously learned. After learning Spanish in high school, you might forget how to speak it if you do not use it. However, if you try to relearn it, you will learn it quicker than the first time. Now, it's important when studying memory that you also understand the parts of the brain that are involved in memory. Carl Lashley and engrams. So Carl Lashley was looking for evidence of an engram. This is the group of neurons that serve as the physical representation of memory. He studied parts of the brain involved in memory by making lesions in the brains of animals such as rats and monkeys. He trained rats to learn their way around a maze then made lesions to try to remove the memory. Lashley was unable to find evidence of an engram. The rats are still able to remember their way around the maze, so he formulated a new hypothesis, which was the equipotentiality hypothesis. If part of one area of the brain involved in memory is damaged, another part of the same area can take over that memory function. Eric Kandel then studied the synapse and its role in controlling the flow of information through neural circuits needed to store memories. Scientists have now identified different parts of the brain involved in memory, including the prefrontal cortex, the amygdala and hippocampus, and the cerebellum. The amygdala is involved in the fear and fear memory. So memory storage is influenced by stress hormones. So our amygdala is really involved in the secretion of our hormones. And if stress is released whenever we're faced with a fear or fight or flight, think fight or flight, 
then our fear memories are going to be attached to our stress hormones, which is from the amygdala. The amygdala also processes emotional information important to encoding memories at a deeper level and memory consolidation. The hippocampus in our brain is associated with explicit memory, recognition memory, and spatial memory. So projects informed, um, project, it projects information to cortical regions to give memories meaning and connect them with other memories. It's also involved in memory consolidation and damage leads to an inability to process new declarative memories. Remember patient HM who we talked about? He had both temporal lobes removed, including his hippocampi, to help control his seizures, but his declarative memory was significantly affected. He could not form new semantic knowledge or episodic memories. So the hippocampus clearly plays a major role in memory. You then have the cerebellum. This plays a role in processing procedural memories, such as how to play the piano and classical conditioning. Damage prevents classical conditioning, such as an eye blink in response to a puff of air. The prefrontal cortex appears to be involved in remembering semantic tasks. PET scans show activation of the left inferior prefrontal cortex when completing semantic tasks, meaning that brain is just lighting up and so engaged when those things are occurring. Now, encoding is associated with left frontal activity. Retrieval of information is associated with the right frontal region. And then your neurotransmitters. So communication among neurons via your neurotransmitters is critical for developing new memories. Repeated neuron activity leads to increased neurotransmitters in the synapse, which leads to stronger synaptic connections. And this is how memory consolidation works. So your neurotransmitters that are involved in memories are things like epinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, glutamate, and acetylcholine. The arousal theory, which is strong emotions trigger the formation of strong memories, and weaker emotions experience form weaker emotions. So strong emotional experiences can trigger the release of neurotransmitters, which strengthen that memory. So if your neurotransmitters are involved, if you're releasing epinephrine and all these other hormones like dopamine and serotonin, then a stronger memory is going to potentially be associated with it because it's got a strong emotional response. This is evidenced by flashbulb memories. A flashbulb memory is an exceptionally clear recollection of an, an event because it was an emotional event and incredibly important to you. This is also an atypical and unusual event. Depending on the age and awareness slash interest of the person, certain flashbulb memories can act as general reference points. Things include like the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, or Martin Luther King, or Malcolm X or Robert Kennedy. Potentially the first humans landing on the moon. In my case, the attacks of September 11th. In your case, it might also be the marathon bombing in Boston. Also, think now of the pandemic, where you were when things shut down and you were told you were no longer going to school. Flashbulb memory formation may depend on cultural references and personal investment and involvement. A national leader suddenly resigning may become a flashbulb memory for those citizens, but only those citizens. An athlete suddenly retiring may become a flashbulb memory for fans of that sport or that team. The death of Kobe Bryant famous Lakers player, was a huge flashball memory. 9-11 is the most recent flashball memory that has been extensively researched and studied. Amnesia is the loss of long-term memory that occurs as a result of disease, physical trauma, or psychological trauma. We talked about this in the last chapter when I asked you that question about HM. Many of you gave, gave incredibly great examples of your own experience with someone who had or displayed amnesia or retro anti-retrograde amnesia or retrograde amnesia. Now memory construction and reconstruction. We construct memories, this is the formulation of new memories, and then we reconstruct them, which is the process of bringing up old memories. When we retrieve memories, we tend to unintentionally alter and modify them resulting in inaccuracies and distortions, which then leads to suggestibility, which is the effect of misinformation from external sources that leads to the creation of false memories. 
This can cause people to claim to remember something that was only a suggestion someone made. Memories are fragile, making them vulnerable to the power of suggestion. An important area of study has been the role of suggestibility in eyewitness testimonies. You have here some research on eyewitness mis misidentification, which is like 75% of the time, percentage of wrongful convention, um, convictions were due to eyewitness misidentification. Now, the misinformation effect was studied in length by Elizabeth Loftid. Loftus. She studied false memories. The misinformation effect paradigm was after exposure to incorrect information, a person may misremember the original event. So the study she conducted in 1974 asked college students to estimate the speed of cars using different forms of questions. Participants were shown films of a car accident were asked to play the role of eyewitness and describe what happened. They were asked about how fast were the cars going when they smashed, collided, bumped, hit, contacted each other. Participants that heard the word smashed estimated the cars were traveling a lot faster than those that heard the word contacted. If they heard the word glass, they were more than twice as likely to say they remember seeing glass, which was a false memory. The implied meaning of the word used influenced the participants' memory of the accident. And you can see that research here. Now, repressed and recovered memories, which is a very controversial, controversial topic within psychology, is the idea that whole events can be repressed or falsely recalled. False memory syndrome is the recall of false autobiographical memories. So repressed memories, some psychologists believe it is possible to completely repress traumatic childhood memories, such as sexual abuse can lead to psychological distress in adulthood. Some believe that these can be recalled through hypnosis and guided imagery techniques. Loftus challenged the idea of repressed memories and questioned if recalled memories are accurate or whether the processes of questioning and suggestibility lead to the misinformation effect. Now we want to look at how can suggestibility be avoided when questioning an eyewitness, if it's such a leading cause. Now the big question of why do we forget? First, it's important to define forgetting. Forgetting is the loss of information from long-term memory. This happens when there's an encoding failure. This occurs when the memory is never stored in our memory in the first place. Remember, successful encoding requires effort and attention. So the example here is, can you tell which coin is the accurate depiction of a US nickel? Most Americans cannot tell which one because we do not encode the specific details. We just don't know enough to differentiate from the other coins. But it doesn't matter to us where the signature is, where in God we trust lies, or even which way the head faces. Now, there are memory errors. Schachter's Seven Sins of Memory include forgetting types. So one is transience. The accessibility of memory decreases over time, also known as storage decay. Second is absent-mindedness, forgetting caused by lapses in attention. And three, blocking. Accessibility of information is temporarily blocked, aka tip of the tongue phenomenon. Then you have distortion type. Misattribution, source of memory is confused. Suggestibility, this causes false memories. And bias, memories are distorted by our current belief system. You then have intrusion. This leads to persistence, the inability to forget undesirable memories. We'll break these things down a little bit further. Ebbinghaus studied the process of memorizations in order to study transience or storage decay weaning over time unused information tends to fade away. This curve shows us how quickly memory memory for new information decays. So 50% after 20 minutes. You've lost 50% of what you just tried to memorize after 20 minutes. 70% of it is gone after 24 hours. 
You then have bias. According to Schachter, your feelings and views of the world can distort your memory of past events. Things like stereotypical biases involve racial and gender biases. After presenting people with a list of names, they more frequently incorrectly remember typical African-American names to be associated with the occupation basketball player and the typical white names to be associated with the occupation politician. The egocentric bias involves enhancing our memories of the past. People remember events in a way that make them look better. You're going to tell the memory that's going to make you look like a better person than you might tell the memory that made you look not like a good person. You then have hindsight bias. The tendency to think an outcome was an, an inevitable after the fact. Thinking you knew it all along. You then have persistence. So many veterans of military conflicts involuntarily recall unwanted and unpleasant memories. These are persistence. You then have interference, and there are two types. You have proactive interference, where old information hinders the rec recollection of new information, or the recall of new information. So you might have, you might learn your combination to high school locker, 170432. The memory of old locker combination interferes with the recall of new gym locker combination, making it more difficult for you to recall the new information. You then have retroactive interference. New information hinders the recall of old information. You learn siblings' new college email address, but the knowledge of the new email address interferes with recall of the old email address. Now, some ways that you can enhance your memory is by rehearsal, so conscious repetition of information to be remembered, chunking, organizing information into meaningful bits or chunks, so separating phone numbers into three digits, elaborative rehearsal, technique in which you think about the meaning of the new information and its relation to knowledge already st stored in your memory, mnemonic devices, memory aids that help us organize information for encoding. One way to remember the order of the planets is the name Mr. Venom J. Sun. Or, how many of you used PEMDAS in school um, for the order of mathematical operations? I also, Roy G. Biv, to understand the order of color. Other techniques for mnemonic devices is expressive writing and saying words out loud. Mnemonic devices, this is this is the knuckle mnemonic to help you remember the number of days in each month. Months with 31 days are resented by the protruding knuckles and shorter months fall in spots between knuckles. And then studying effectively. Memory techniques can be useful when studying for class. Using elaborative rehearsal, link information to other information slash memories to make it more meaningful. Apply the self-reference effect. Make information personally meaningful to you. Oftentimes, when you're answering your chapter questions, I always want you to provide personal examples. That clearly shows to me that you're understanding the concept and what we're asking you for. Don't forget the forgetting curve. Keep studying to prevent storage decay. Rehearse. Rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. Be aware of interference. Study without distractions. Keep moving. Aerobic exercise promotes neurogenesis, growth of new brain cells in the hippocampus. Get enough sleep. The brain consolidates memories while you're sleeping. And make use of mnemonic devices. Now your questions for chapter four include protection. How does sensory memory help keep you from being overwhelmed? We talked about sensory memory. Your memory system first takes in your sensory memory, which is really quick and fast. Think of it like a filter, filtering out the stuff that's unimportant to you so that you don't be overwhelmed. So that what then moves into the short-term memory could potentially be rehearsed over and over to then move into the long-term memory. Sensory memory, how does it help you decide whether or not to respond to a stimuli? Think again about that filter. You're picking out important parts so that when you do go to make a decision about what to respond to, you know that you're responding to something that's important and not important. Repressed memory. Critique the evidence for and the evidence against repressed memory. You may need to use additional outside sources beyond your textbook, but talk, but learn and read chapter eight. It goes into repressed memory in great detail. 
Four is flashbulb memories. What are flashbulb memories and why are they so vivid even many years after the event? So remember you review the slide on flashbulb memories. It will help you answer that question. If you have any questions and you need to reach out to me, please don't hesitate to use my email address, nwest, N-W-E-S-T, at westfield.ma.edu. Have a great week.